sorry, the number you have dialed is not in service at this time. Am I the only one who thinks this is totally insane? Rob, we're fighting theological injustice here. They're not using just weights and measures. He said we have 50 listeners. I think he's being generous. Read your Bible is interpreted by experts. Rob, are you as shocked as I am? It's nonsense. If you've given any money to this, you need to complain. You ask for your money back. I don't know about you, but I find this annoying. What up and shalom. Welcome to the Rob and Caleb Show. The show where theology matters, scholarship counts, and theology matters. My name is Caleb Haig. I got two people with me today, Rob Van Hoff and my father, Tim Haig. What up, guys? How's it going? All right. Hey. <laughs> yeah. So we're back after uh, two weeks off. It was very nice. We went to family camp. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. Then I went down to Disneyland. I have to say, if you want to spend copious amounts of money to stand in line and be in huge crowds, Disneyland is the place for you. The question is, how did Ben like it? <laughs> well, since none of my in-laws listen to this, I'll be honest with you. He kept saying, Dad, I'm bored. I want to go home. <laughs> oh. oh. <laughs> uh, well, you know, Ben is a lot like me. He's, uh, he, he's a homebody. He likes being at home. Uh, he doesn't like going places. If it was up to him, he'd just lay on the couch all day long and, and uh, you know, read. Like or you. Whatever. Yeah, like <laughs> me. And uh, so now that he's back, he keeps saying, Dad, I want to go back to Disneyland. So he did have some fun. And he went on his first roller coaster. That was uh, that was a interesting time. He screamed the whole time. It was great. But then once we were once we were off the roller roller coaster, he wanted to go back on it again. Uh, we went on the Pirates of the Caribbean ride twice. That was uh, that was fun. And uh, yeah, I think in three days we went on six rides. And uh, yeah, it was you know he had he had a, he had a good time. It's just a lot of walking. I, so on my app, on my phone, I got an app that tells you how much you walk in a day. On uh, the Thursday that we were there, we, we walked 11 miles. Cool. And we walked 11 miles, half of them carrying children because we didn't have a stroller for half of it. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, it's, uh, it, but it was, it was fun. It was good to be with my uh, in-laws and, uh, you know, to spend time with them. Spared at no expense, of course. They, uh, they know how to put on a... a incredible time for the kids basically anything the kids looked at or touched grandma was going to buy for them so you know uh yeah that was interesting what about you rob what'd you do while uh while i was gone well let's see last week i was still kind of getting in gear for our fall quarter at which, Torah resource institute which just started yep and excited we've got a real healthy greek class i think we have 10 plus students in greek first year nice. greek nice we've got Three students in Aramaic. We've got uh, several students in our Judaism of the first century, um, and several in our uh, Jewish mystical traditions. We've, it's. Uh, I feel a little bit like I'm a, a cook. I've got a bunch of burners. I got a, different things cooking at different temperatures, and I got to move them around and make sure nothing burns. Now, Dad, <laughs> now, Dad I, I haven't even looked. How many people do you have in your uh, beginning Hebrew class? I think I have uh, about 17. Whew. Wow, that's great. Yeah, that's a lot. So as, as all uh, language courses tend to go, I'm sure you'll probably have like seven by next quarter. Actually, I just counted. I have 19. And there will be some, uh, you know, that's typical. Uh, it's like the Marines. We, well, you will good. drop out. <laughs> <laughs> The same thing happened in, you know, in my seminary days. I mean, we started out uh, beginning Hebrew uh, the first year that I had uh, seminary classes, and uh, the classroom was full. And by the second semester, it was about half full. And so, I mean, uh, language is, is something that takes a lot of your time, a lot of your effort, but it obviously is worth it if you stick with it. Right. right. Yeah, for sure. Okay, so let's talk about camp for a few minutes while I have, I, you know, I, I realize that I'm missing a, uh, I'm missing a sound bite here. I'll pull that up. Um, so uh, we, 
two weeks ago, we were at uh, Tor Resource Institute Family Camp. It was fourth of, annual. Fourth annual. It was probably one of the smaller crowds we've ever had. We only had about a hundred and what about hundred and five people there. And normally, uh, I think we've had anywhere between one hundred and ten and one hundred and thirty normally. Um, but I thought it went very well. And uh, so let's talk about some of what happened and also favorite points. The theme this year was the Psalms and family worship. So uh, both uh, Rob and my dad presented it at uh, family camp. And so, and also Gary. And, and also Gary, that's right. Um, so Caleb can come up a bit. I will turn myself up a bit. Okay. Um, uh, Tim and Rob can come down a bit. Well, I don't know how to do that. He said or. He said bring you up. Oh, or yeah, yeah. Okay, balanced. I got it. I, so I did it. Um, okay. Balance. So anyway, um, yeah, tell us what uh, you presented on. Uh, Dad, you go first. I presented on Psalm 1 and Psalm 36. Um, I tried to not only uh, do some teaching on those two psalms, but also to kind of give some suggestions on how it might be used, for instance, for family devotions, how you might— um, you know, ask questions of the older, older, uh, your older children and have discussions and so forth. Uh, obviously, because Psalm 1 starts the, the Psalter, and we talked about questions about why they would have, when, when the Psalms were compiled together as a book, why they would have started with Psalm 1, which of course is that Psalm 1 is telling us to meditate upon the Torah day and night. And the idea then was that these Psalms, inspired again by the very Spirit of God, would uh, would lead us to the same teachings, the same themes, and reinforce actually the foundational teachings of the Torah. So, uh, and then we went on to thirty six and looked at that and uh, saw how that uh, a bit of a larger psalm could be used in the same way to uh, just talk about it as a family, uh, talk about it, and uh, inculcate the teachings of it uh, into our hearts and lives. Okay, and uh, Rob, I was told by two separate people. Uh, at two separate times, nonetheless, that uh, your, te- your your teaching was the best teaching they'd ever heard you give. It, give. Wow. <laughs> so some high praise to the Hoff at family camp. Uh, I'm, tell I'm, us, tell I'm us a late what, bloomer. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> tell us what you uh, taught. I focused on, on Psalm 19, which is, uh, you know, that it starts out, the heavens declare the glory of God. And it ends with... May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable before you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer, mm-hmm. Zuri Wali. And we kind of went through and noticed the three different partitions of that psalm and uh, how the, God's creation testifies to his glory. His revealed word uh, declares his glory. And uh, in the end, the, la- the third section is this the servant, the Evid, who desires that his mouth too would join in. And, and he's confronted with the dilemma of sin, of why is there this gap? Why am I unable to, why don't I always glorify God like, like his creation? And that's why the last word, my redeemer, is so critical. Mm. Uh, you know, I, it just since then I was uh, meditating on the Lord's Prayer, and it, it starts out, our Father who is in the heavens, and it ends your kingdom come, right? Or, or pardon me, at the very end. Um, for yours is the, the kingdom and the power and the glory. Uh, so, so even in Yeshua's uh, prayer that we're, we're taught, um, it's, there's a kind of bookend with the Father who's in heaven and ending, affirming his glory, just like we see in, in Psalm 19. So, yeah, I, I really... Uh, was uh, amazed as preparing for camp, meditating on Psalm 19 and memorizing it in Hebrew and and just chewing on it. And it, it just is a testimony, as Tim could say for Psalm 1 and 36, and, and Gary for the Psalms he did, and for Josh who did Psalm 90, that uh, there is no substitute for nourishing our souls with the Word of, of God. Amen. That, that, that is absolutely necessary. He knows he knows us, he made us, and he gave us words to, to help feed our souls. And if we neglect that, there's no, you might, it's, it's as if looking for nutrients in foods that are not really good for you. Um, 
you, it might seem like you're getting by for a while, but ultimately you're going to get sick. You're going to, you know, things are going to go south. It's not sustainable. We need God's word. And, and so uh, having that focus and that theme of the Psalms was just a blessing to me. So it's, it's, uh, I'm encouraged to hear people also to, uh, we're blessed. Can I put a plug for a, another, uh, uh, Josh, uh, gave a, uh, Josh Meeks. Yeah. Josh Meeks gave a presentation that was awesome. Totally. Okay, so, so we should just explain for people, uh, who, who obviously weren't there. What we do is we have, uh, we have the teachers of Torah resource teach main sessions in the morning time. Then after lunch, we try to have, um, uh, guest speakers and usually they're uh, their students. So we have students from Torah Resource Institute pr present papers that they they've either given throughout the uh, throughout the year or something that they're working on. And so Josh Meeks is a student at uh, Torah Resource Institute. Then Andre Felipe, uh, he also is a student at Torah Resource Institute. He also presented, and I missed both of those unfortunately because I was uh, I was doing other I was directing other things at the time. Uh, so to talk a little bit about both of those. Go ahead, Rob. With, well, and uh, Josh. of course, so yeah, so uh, Gary Springer gave two That's uh, true, yeah. teachings, Josh Meeks on the Psalms. I wanted to point out, um, Andre did, uh, he didn't follow the, the theme of the Psalms, but gave an excellent uh, presentation as well. And I was encouraged uh, by his to see his attention to detail, his attention to sources, and um, he, what uh, Andre uh, shows in his paper is how certain strains of of teachers or traditions that have crept into messianic uh, larger messianic kind of ideas um, is attributing is you know another area where anachronism has uh, sadly uh, messed up people's thinking um, and the example is when we teach about uh, you know, Christmas or Easter or some of these um, traditions that have come into the body of Messiah over the last several centuries, um, as to be careful as to how we uh, talk about them, that we want to be, uh, we want to use just weights and measures, right? We don't want to bring in new lies. And and basically what he shows, I think it is it the Two Babylons is one of the books. Yeah, yeah Hislop's um, uh Two Babylons, yes. Yeah, and, and Michael Rood, basically teachers who have conflated all sorts of evidence from the ancient Near East to try to make an argument. And uh, really, that doesn't help us. It, it doesn't help us when we give people a, a bunch of new falsities in order to try to sell a truth. Right. Uh, and, you know, let me add Let me add one thing there. Yeah, uh, If you do some research on uh, Hislop's uh, Two Babylons, so the book The Two Babylons, even when it came, first was published— uh, the scholarship of the times in the late 1800s, early 1900s, uh, showed clearly that he had made major, major mistakes uh, in that book, and yet it continued to be uh, perpetrated, it continued to be a standard by a lot of uh, offshoots from the mainline Christian churches. And unfortunately, as you said, and as Andre uh, pointed out very well, some of those same uh, mistakes are being uh, repeated again and again in some of the things that we're seeing coming out of uh, of the messianic movement, which just reinforces uh, again we need uh, we need to seek for good scholarship that's based upon primary data, uh, if at all possible, so that uh, uh, we don't fall into those same kind of errors. Yeah, and then another uh, another person who presented, and we don't want to leave him out. Spiros Pissaris, a.k.a. Spike Pissaris, who has done our created solar system. He's done the uh, various series. So there's three uh, videos out now. I thought that was going to be it. I thought it was a three-volume series. It's not. He's actually going to be doing more. Um, yep. And uh, we sell his DVDs at Torah Resource. He was at camp and uh, presented. Uh, what psalm did he touch on? Does anybody remember? 104. Yeah, 104. 104. Uh, okay. And with pertaining to this idea of, a, of uh, like apparently, you know, and because I'm it's only tangential to my focus, I wasn't aware that some of these scholars dealing with creation and flood and, and chronology of of uh, of the creation, whether it's old earth or evolution or whatever, that they touch on Psalm 104 as a source. Right. Um, so that was very enlightening. Yeah, yeah it's so clear that it, I mean, we're one of the big world view challenges we have is do we see creation as created? <laughs> Do we serve the Creator, capital C, who created everything we see? 
Right. Or, uh, and the challenge to that is what's being taught all over the place is that it's an evolutionary model and there is no creator. You know, I, I, I know this is a bit of a, an aside here, but I'll make it quick. Um, in a, a study that we're just starting up, uh, First John, the first epistle of John, it seems clear that John is combating early, uh, shall we say, nascent Gnosticism that's rising and the her heresy that that brought into the uh, followers of the way. And it seems to me that in some measure, not I'm not trying to do tit for tat here, but in some measure, the idea of trying to wed the biblical account of creation with the Darwinian theory of evolution or some form of that theory is, again, just an attempt to uh, make things fit the way that our present society and our present worldview in general would like it to fit. And so the Gnostics were trying to amalgamate Greek mysticism, uh, you know, into uh, a, a, a biblical view and try to wed the two together, and it just doesn't work. It always turns out to bear falsehoods. Yeah, so um, Spike is, uh, every time Spike speaks, he's uh, not only is he a great speaker, but he's uh, extremely interesting to listen to because he's so well learned. Uh, yeah. I, 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 I can only highly recommend to everyone that they uh, take a look at his video series, which can be found at Tor Resource, and also on others. Uh, he's all over the place. He's, uh, his, his video series has become uh, kind of a, a uh, standard in the uh, evolution slash creation debate, mm -hmm. uh, which is so, yeah. Anyway, it was great having him there as well. Um, so uh, some of the other things that people miss when they don't come to camp, and uh, we'll just plug all these so that you guys can uh, out there can start getting ready to, to sign up for camp. We usually start registration in January, so it's coming up uh, in not too long. We'll start registration for the 2017 camp. One of the really nice things, not we always get to meet new people, which is always a lot of fun, and there's a lot of fellowship. But uh, Many people might not realize this, but sort of the Bruce Springsteen of, of messianic music is uh, Rob Van Hoff himself. Uh, he's he just has not yet been uh, fully discovered as he should be. And uh, every year at camp, we always get to hear the latest uh, songs that are created by Rob, and he always debuts them at camp. And then we learn them, and throughout the year, we perfect them. And then we come back, and what always happens is we put them <laughs> late in the rotation of worship music at night, and it doesn't matter where we put them, Rob will miss them. He will be off talking to someone. He'll still be in the cafeteria eating. He will never hear his own songs played by us, but he always teaches us new ones. And uh, that is that was certainly <laughs> – he, he had a new one that was off the charts. Sorry, I apologize. Uh, yeah, that was – that was I, I felt kind of sheepish at that one. I, I – I made it to worship about halfway through, and someone said, "I think we just did a song you wrote." And I'm like, "Oh, really? I, I was clueless." I had no every idea. year, every single year, it's like that. But uh, but hey, on that note, all the great musicians. Oh boy, we had uh, even even some that sat in spontane uh, spontaneously, like Andre and Roel, and um, I know that. Uh, oh, the I Gonzalez gir girls. Yeah. Some of the Gonzalez girls. Caleb, you played bass. You played. Did you play a little guitar? Oh, it was I, great. We had Brian. We had Spike on the kit. Tim on the on the trumpet. We had. It, it was great. great. You know, with that, you know, and we'll see if there's uh, how many people listen to this radio show. Some one of the musicians left a silver guitar capo at camp. I have it in my possession. And I'm trying to find out who it belongs to. Well, no, it's yours because there's tape on it. And if you can tell us what color the tape is, we'll know it's yours. <laughs> uh, but no, uh, it's okay. You don't have to be uh, embarrassed to admit that you use a capo. Just let me know, and uh, and I'll send it to you. Um, so, and and we get a lot of feedback on camp. The the campfire at night, I think, is one of people's favorite times because it goes sometimes all the way through the night. And uh, there's music that's being played. People get to sit and chat with each other. Uh, a lot of the time, the younger kids have gone to bed. So mothers who have been taking care of kids most of the day get a break. And the dads get to sit in the room and, and watch the kids sleep. So uh, let's talk about favorite things at camp, favorite times at camp. My personal favorite thing about camp is every year we have a baptism. Call it what you want, mikvah, baptism. Uh, it's... For, for me, you know, I'm, I'm running around trying to make sure everything goes smoothly. 
and uh, trying to make sure that things are all you know things are all going well. Um, and so, but the the baptism is a time to stop, and and uh, everybody has their you know nothing else is going on during the baptism. And uh, to me, it's really a special time because it's uh, you know people who have who are openly uh, declaring their faith in the Messiah Yeshua. I, I think some people don't realize the weight of what is uh, is happening when we uh, when we baptize people at, at camp. I, I think it's a, a very wonderful thing. So uh, that's my favorite part. Anybody else? I like the I like the skits and the the puppet shows. Um, I, because I like to see the children just so engaged in, in, uh, in the food. Yeah, so every night we the have... The ladies pu- who run the... I, there's so much. I can't pick one thing, Caleb. <laughs> you know, I like, I like just being able to sit and talk theology, uh, at, you know, just in a casual way. People will come up and say, I have a question, and then you get a circle around, and you start discussing those things. It's, it's not planned, but it's the kind of things that aren't on people's hearts. And you make connection with people... Maybe that you that you uh, see online in other venues, and uh, and you get to put a face, you know, to the name, and and you get time to to just kind of network with people, pretty much all over the United States and Canada. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So there's there's all sorts of great things that go on at camp, and if you missed it, you should uh, try to come next year. Uh, puppet shows uh, two of the nights, and then on the final night. We always have a really fun time because what we do is we break in the beginning of camp. We break everybody up in teams. This year there was four teams, and uh, each team has a passage of scripture that they are given, and then they have to uh, make a play and interpret that passage of scripture uh, t- uh, for 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 us to to watch and and see. And whoever does the best at that uh, wins wins the the bragging rights. And uh, it's always really quite funny to see how people uh, try to recreate these these sketches. Um, I tell people at the beginning that they can do it however they want, whether it's uh, interpretive dance or singing or whatever they want. They can. And uh, man, I I gotta say, every year, it, it's unbelievable what people come up with. It is so funny. Uh, I I think that uh, for those who were at camp, the uh, the. The mental picture of Maya with wings on and a guitar being the Spaniard angel of God will be burned in everyone's mind until next year. Which hey, uh, what's up, bro? Or, or... Yeah, yeah, it's just <laughs> so good, man. I mean, we just laugh. We laughed so hard we were crying. And but the nice thing here's the funny thing about those sketches. You know, we go home and. Sometimes it's passages of scriptures that I have never read to Ben, who's almost four. And he'll remember, he'll remember the plays and what happened. He'll remember the stories in the play. So even though, you know, even though we're adapting some of the Bible stories a little bit to, uh, you know, to have a good time, uh, the, the stories actually stick, I think, in the minds of the children, uh, which is a great thing. So, yeah, camp was a great time. Uh, anything else on camp that anybody wants to, to say? All right, we'll move on. Um, Okay, so I have to touch on this real quick. Actually, we have uh, questions for my father. Three weeks ago, four weeks ago, I don't remember. Weeks ago, my dad uh, took Rob's spot as he was on vacation, and now we have several several questions. Should we do this first, or should we do our new segment? Let's do our new new segment. You want to do our new segment? So... uh, well, we asked uh, we asked Gary to well, and we're not calling him Gary now. This the segment is by uh, Gimel Headhand. Uh, well, Gimel, but Camel, this, this, Camel Headhand. Okay, so this is this is uh, or Rope Headhand, depending rope on head, your yes. basic So so, so uh, this is uh, uh, Rob asked Gary to give us a new segment interpreting various um, <laughs> various Paleo Hebrew uh, so that we can better understand. Uh, modern day paleo Hebrew. This is what we have come up with. Shalom and welcome to Hebrew word pictures with Gimel head hand or 
as some later scholars might say, rope head hand. <laughs> Today, we're going to explore the Hebrew picture roots of cup and also coffee. These two words in their original Paleo Hebrew had a cough and a pay, which makes a lot of sense if you're trying to drink something. You need to have something other than your hand to go to your mouth. So when they invented the cup, they decided the best thing we could do to intensify this experience is to take the dogish out of the pay and make it cafe. <laughs> And then, for those who understand even the deeper roots, the feminine version, when she is a mighty fine cup of coffee, you put cuff hay or cuff ha, and the hay shows the extreme joy in the cup of coffee. This has been a Paleo Hebrew Word Picture Moments with Gimel Head Hand. There you have it, Gimel Head Hands. I had no clue we were doing that until uh, until er, er, late yesterday. Okay, <laughs> let's move on. We got questions from my father, and this is the reason that he's on today. Two questions. One, uh, both of these came on our Facebook page. Thank you, people, for finally posting your questions on the Facebook page. It helps a lot. Uh, I can try to read this, but my Greek pronunciation is uh, atrocious, so maybe uh, somebody can help me. The first one, could you get your father to answer here, for the record, one thing he did not explain on the show. How do you presume a gathering, quote, gathering for, from ekastas ek, uh, humon par heautou? It looks to me like the Greek here does double emphasis to indicate a private personal circumstance rather than indicating a gathering. Perhaps he is... Perhaps he is thinking that they would then collect from each individual to be ready. But I think that is adding to the context. What the context is clearly saying is to be arrangements ahead of time. But couldn't that be understood to mean not waiting to put aside until later? Would the present subject, subjunctive of, uh, is it hey or is hey dota? Uh, dota. Okay, possibly indicate an ongoing process of prospering and then remembering each first day to set some aside. Is there any historical information that might inform us about paydays in that time? Were workers paid daily or weekly? The clear statement, statement we are given is each of you by yourself, not each of you together, which would make more sense if they were meeting. Okay, good. Uh, let me make a clarification. First of all, uh, the number of weeks ago when we were talking about this on the radio program, uh, I, I didn't mean to in, uh, imply that everyone necessarily got together in one single place at the same time on the first day of the week in order to uh, collect monies. Okay, that I, if I gave that... And, uh, and what, what passage are we referring to again? Uh, 1 Corinthians 16 one okay. and following. Um, uh, you know, okay, it starts out, uh, uh, the text says, now concerning the collection for the saints, that is for the, the believers, as I directed the churches of Galatia, so do you also. And then he says on the first day of the week, and this is the uh, text that the uh, person is particularly having questions about. I believe this uh, is Lois Morgan. Keep going. On the first day of the week, each one of you is to put aside and save as he may prosper so that no collections be made when I come. Now, uh, the question that she has is, does that, was I implying that they all, you know, left their homes and went to a gathering place on the first day of the week? No, I, I'm not implying that. But I think that when we look at the whole context, he says, um, so on the first day of the week, each one of you is to put aside and save as he may prosper so that no collection collections may be made when I come. Now, the, the interesting thing is that the word collections here uh, seems to be in the plural. It is in the plural because it's the eudotai, and uh, that means a gift. It's clearly not something that he's requiring them to do. He's, uh, like he said earlier in chapter 8, he wants them to give of their own volition uh, freely without any compulsion. So uh, what I take this to mean is that on the first day of the week, uh, people should set aside money or should at that point in time start saying, what can we give this week? But my suggestion is, is that they didn't just keep it in their own homes or in their own living quarters, but that they actually went and deposited it somewhere. 
it could be one at a time. Somebody could do it first thing in the morning. Others could do it later in the day or at night or whatever. And the reason that I suggest that is because he says, so that no collections, plural, may be made when I come. So it isn't that everyone is bringing, when, when Paul finally comes, and you know this was for the, uh, the, the poor uh, believer, the believers who were impoverished in, in uh, Jerusalem during the time of the famine. He was bringing them funds in order to buy food and so forth. So uh, what he's saying is, when I come, I don't want everyone to have to come and bring their money. I want, them, I want the money to have already been collected. My suggestion is that it is a command given to each individual household, Okay, and it is a command to set it aside, but why does he say put aside and save? I think it may well mean put it aside, that is, bring it and put it in a central treasury. Now, all of us, uh, I think all of us, <laughs> I know this is certainly the true for my, uh, my household, uh, if, if we don't allocate money at the first of the month for the bills that we're going to have, if we wait until later on and say, oh, okay, we, I guess we need to pay bills, we oftentimes wouldn't have the money saved aside. So we budget, as it were. I don't think that the, he was asking people to keep the money on the, in their own place because what happens is if you start putting money in a cookie jar, uh, you know, six months later you say, oh, we got this much in the cookie jar, we can do this with it, and it's used for something else. I think more than likely they were having a central depository, some maybe a uh, deacon, some shamashim that were uh, c collecting these funds and and then um, using them, uh, or collecting them, and uh, so that when Paul came, he could give them. Now the question of uh, pay, of course, the Torah says that one is to be paid every evening at the end of the day. So amongst the Jewish people, that may have been uh, a, a common thing. We don't know. There's no indication whether that was actually happening in the first century. The other thing, which uh, goes to her second question, but I'll just start here, and that is uh, slavery was huge in Rome. Now, there were all kinds of classes of slaves. The, the majority of the slaves, however, worked either in the mines or in the fields, agrarian or mining, okay? The worst job was the mining. The second worst job were the fields because they were the most intense uh, in terms of labor, uh, there were oftentimes, uh, you know, the beating of the slaves if they didn't get a quota done and so forth and so on. So um, were the slaves paid? In later Rome, in imperial Rome, there were some compensations given to slaves, so much so that what we discover is that there were slaves who saved enough money to win their freedom, to buy their freedom. So there was some slaves who had money. But they were still slaves. They were the lowest echelon of the society. They were opposite of freemen or f free workers. Now, the majority, as far as we can tell from the data that, that I've searched out at least, the majority of work done in Imperial Rome was done by slaves. There were those who even suggested, there are some uh, documents that have suggested that landowners decided they should do away with their paid uh, laborers and just get uh, slaves. The difficulty was, especially for agrarian uh, parts of the society, you had to continue to support the slave, that is, give him or her room and board, even during the off-season when they weren't working in the fields, whereas you could hire uh, you know, free la uh, you know, free men laborers and you would only pay them for the work they did. However, the pay that you paid a free man uh, worker was higher, much, much higher than what you would have ever paid the slaves, and most slaves weren't paid. They were just given room and board. So uh, when wages were paid, that's a very difficult thing. It doesn't seem like there was a standard. It seems that they were paid sometimes for the job. They were paid other times by other kinds of things besides money. They were paid for uh, with uh, food. They were paid with, uh, you know, animals from the farm, those kinds of things. Uh, sometimes they were paid with, uh, with clothing. I, I read one thing yesterday when I was researching this that uh, in, there was one document that said a landowner gave his, not his paid slaves, not his free slaves, but his indentured slaves, he gave them one set of clothing, which include an outer garment and, and undergarments, one time every two years. <laughs> I mean, 
Can you imagine that, you know, so uh, to, to have extra clothing was a real luxury and sometimes they were paid for excellent service or they were given a reward by giving extra clothing and sometimes those that were actually not indentured slaves or household slaves but were uh, hired slaves or hired laborers were paid with clothing. So we really don't have the kind of pay that we're thinking of in our day where you would get, you know, a, a, a check or money, uh, something like that every week or every day, whatever. So we really don't know. So the other question that we have uh, is along so kind of the same lines because it's talking about slaves. You've uh, taught before that uh, that one of the reasons Paul was speaking, uh, teaching so late into the night when the guy fell out of the, w the window uh, was because uh, the, the uh, slaves weren't, a lot, weren't able to show up until after the sun had gone down on Shabbat. Uh, and so this person says, what is your original source that shows the Gentiles were slaves to the Romans and were obligated to work seven days a week. I read in Acts 18.4 that Paul was teaching the Jews and the Gentiles on the Sabbath in the synagogue. Another source I read said the Jews were forbidding the Gentiles from entering into the synagogues because of uncircumcision. I don't know if you said that the Gentiles were slaves. No, that, that's in the question of the <laughs> conflation there of slaves and Gentiles. Not all Gentiles were slaves. They were very wealthy Gentiles. Um, and, uh, you know, we find even in some of the... Uh, uh, documents, Roman documents, Greek documents, that there were uh, there were Gentiles, uh, you know, who were within the uh, Jewish community that were very wealthy. There were Gentiles that gave money to and you know to build synagogues and so forth and so on. So uh, there's no question there. But uh, the, the, uh, I don't have the original source. Uh, in fact, I can tell you where I learned it myself was from uh, one of my professors at seminary when we were doing uh, ancient Near Eastern history, um, and we were doing history of the uh, of, of the first century as well. And he made that statement. Uh, but I can say this: that we know that the, as I said, the majority of slaves worked either in the mines. Uh, or or in the fields. Now, it was just common practice that laborers in the fields labored during the daytime. Uh, we have the saying uh, of, uh, I believe it's of Yeshua uh, in the Gospels where he says uh, that uh, we work when the time is day and when night comes, it, the work is over. And he's using that to refer to eschatological, doing what you must do and can do now uh, for there's a time when this world is going away and so forth and so on. I'm paraphrasing, obviously. So that would mean that, that those, the majority of slaves who were uh, giving room and board in homes would have been, the majority of them would have not necessarily been just household, but they would have been out in the fields. This would mean that they generally worked seven days a week from sun up to sundown, and therefore, oftentimes, their gatherings with the followers of Yeshua, those that had come to faith in the Messiah, would have been aft in the evenings. Now, can I prove that from documents? I don't have a uh, primary source to prove that, but it does make sense that we do have primary documents that show um, that the majority of slaves were working in the fields and that they did work seven days a week. Tacitus, in his histories, and I can give you this source if somebody wants to. I don't have it here at my desk, but I can give it to you. Tacitus, a historian, makes uh, a jab at the Jewish communities. Rem and let me make an aside here. Remember, those that were following Yeshua, whether they were Jew or Gentile, would have been classed as Jewish or part of the Jewish community because they went to the temple, they, they uh, kept the Sabbath as much as they could, and so forth and so on. So even the slaves that were Gentiles who were followers of Yeshua would have been viewed by someone like Tacitus, a uh, historian of that period, uh, would have been viewed as amalgamated with the Jews. And he says the Jews are lazy. And why is that? Because they're lazy and they're superstitious. They, they, they worship Saturn. How does he say they worship Saturn? Because they take Saturday off. They take the day of Saturn off. They don't, they don't work on it. And why are, why are they superstitious? Because they believe that uh, certain sacrifices at their temple, they believe that attending together uh, is somehow empowering to them. And so uh, it would seem to me, therefore, that there was this agape that uh, is spoken about in the Epistle of Jude, the agape feast, which was what? It was a, a, a symbolic meal 
that would put Jew and Gentile together, that would put rich and poor together, that would be free and, and bound together. And Paul talks about in Galatians 3, right? At the end of Galatians 3, he says, there's the, neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither male nor female, there's neither bond nor free. Well, where would the bonded people, those who were slaves, where would they gather together with the people of God if indeed, and I do say if, if indeed the majority of them were laborers in fields? When would they get together during the agricultural season to manifest this oneness, it would have had to have been after, you know, when, when it began to be dark and when the, they were coming out of the fields because they were not working during the dark in the fields. And that seems to me to fit uh, the passage there in Acts 20. One more comment on that, and that is there are some who say that he was teaching late on the first day of the week, not after Sabbath. Some think that he was teaching late on Sunday and Sunday went into midnight, and then he was leaving on Monday. Uh, I think the context would say, no, he was there. They were they were fellowshipping at the end of the Sabbath. He continued on uh, for those who were there and perhaps for those who would come uh, after the sun had set. All right. Good enough. I uh, hope that answers everybody's question. Uh, now, Dad, if you want to take off, you can, but I think you will want to stick around. And then we got some good stuff uh coming up here yeah First I'm, of, I'm loaded up for gear okay so uh <laughs> we got a uh email today i got a, a facebook message today from someone uh and they sent me a link uh, it says it, this person made the video it's called does gear mean convert reply to torah resource um uh, first of all, thank you for making a video because uh, you know we get nailed all the time by people for for uh, recording our Rob and Caleb show. Yeah, fellow heirs, exactly. <laughs> yeah, uh, get the book, fellow heirs. That's that's the book, that's yeah. the main that's the main response. Um, uh, the video itself is seven seventeen minutes and thirty seven seconds long. I've never heard of the this person. Uh, I've never heard of the the YouTube p page that uh, this person is is. Uh, is on so what um, i hear you saying Caleb, we cannot can, cannot confirm this is one of the 36 that's right but you never can tell um and here's the thing is that uh this person takes quite a long time to uh to that's the newer one <laughs> <laughs> uh this person takes quite a long time to explain through the hebrew grammar why ger would mean something different he uh, talks about how a ger would be circumcised and he talks about how uh, the gear certainly now. In all fairness, I watched about ten minutes of the of the seventeen minute video. I didn't have time this morning as I was preparing for the show uh, to watch the whole thing. But uh, here's the basic uh, response that I'd have to this person, and my father might have another response as well. Uh, you still have not. Hey, let's make sure everybody knows what gear means. Okay, go ahead. Uh, gear is a Hebrew noun that is based upon a verb gur, which means to sojourn. It generally speaks of someone who is outside of their own country or their own community, and they're traveling or they're living in a so-called foreign place where they don't have the same privileges they would if they were at home. Exactly. Okay, so even through Hebrew grammar, this person has completely neglected the argument outright. And the argument is... Not that it means somebody who uh, is sojourning and outside of the people. And we're not saying that uh, a ger would not become circumcised. Circumcision is one of the commandments. We believe that a ger would keep the same commandments as the native born. Uh, this is what one Torah theology teaches. Uh, but this person has completely neglected the, uh, the entire argument. Our argument is, is that the idea, the, the ritual... The so-called ritual of conversion, first of all, is found nowhere in the Tanakh. You can't find anywhere where it says, this is how you convert, or this is how you do a ritual. It was made up, and it was made up after the Maccabean period. So to say that a word from the Torah, ger, means a conversion process, to, that someone can become Jewish, is totally an anachronistic. Mm -hmm. and, and and from and now maybe it's in the last 17 minute or the last seven minutes that this person uh, uh, responded. But once again, you would have to bring the proof that uh, that we had some kind of a conversion process before the Maccabean period, which I don't think is possible because there simply was not one. Moses was not thinking that someone would come in and do a ritual of conversion to become part of Israel. That's simply not the case. 
Would, would a gear become circumcised? Of course, it was a Torah command. But that's not the argument. The argument is, is that there was no, there was no uh, ritual of conversion. Anyone have anything else to add to that? Well, it's. I think it's pretty well uh, documented that you know, if you uh, if you study it out, that the the word proselytos in the Greek, which oftentimes translates gear, uh, the Septuagint oftentimes uses either that or perokos, uh, those two, but primarily proselytos um, translates the word gear, and you can see in the Septuagint that proselytos, this Greek word, is becoming more and more a technical word with a religious connotation, okay? And the reason is, is because it is used most often when, and not always, but most often when the later rabbis, or shall we say even the emerging uh, uh, Jewish theology of the Pharisees uh, following the time of the Maccabees, when they were trying to make a clear distinction between the native-born and and the the uh, the proselyte, in other words, the convert. They wanted to make the convert because they wanted to strengthen their numbers, but they also wanted to keep a clear distinction. Okay, so, uh, and there are good there are good uh, scholars who would say uh, that this is uh, seems to be a movement in the Septuagint. Now, let's just say that the Septuagint uh, is finished sometime. Uh, in the first century uh, uh, BCE, we think the Torah would have been earlier than uh, translated earlier than that. Maybe the prophets in the second, but probably the writings and so forth not till the first. So somewhere, let's just put it neutral in the second century. You have this translation, which is being used by a lot of Jewish people, that is using the term proselytos, from which we get the word proselyte. Again, that is translating the word ger out of the Hebrew. Uh, they're using that now in more of a technical religious kind of an, a point of view. However, recently, well, let's say within the last, uh, uh, I don't know, I don't know exactly, I don't remember the date when it was found, uh, there, they found a papyrus in uh, Egypt, northern Egypt, an Egyptian papyrus. It's dated, and it, there's not much uh, debate on this, it's dated to the 3rd century BCE. And it uses the Greek word proslutos, but it has nothing to do at all with the with uh, a religious connotation. There's nothing on this scrap of papyrus that has anything to do with religion. And really what it's talking about is some foreign workers that are causing a commotion, apparently with regard to their wages or something to that effect. So here we have a papyrus at the same time that the term was beginning to gain a religious connotation. We have it being used outside of a religious uh, circle to simply mean foreigners. It has nothing to do with religion. What does that tell you? It's, to me, it tells me that if, and this, I, I, I hate to say it, but this is something that uh, some of the ministries and the, the larger ministries in the Messianic movement uh, came out saying that we should understand the Septuagint to be uh, interpreting the use, this Greek uh, word proselytos, uh, or proselyte, we should understand the Septuagint to be giving meaning to that word as it's found in the New Testament or the Apostolic Scriptures. Well, th that's a stretch, okay? What really is a stretch is to think that this term, this Greek term that doesn't come to any religious connotation until maybe the second century BCE should be retrofitted anachronistically put back onto the Hebrew of the Torah, okay? That would be like saying there was a special ritual in the time of Moses for people who wanted to join the First Baptist Church. <laughs> you know, it, it's just obvious that that, that would be, that you know, somebody would scratch their head and say, whoever's saying this is, it doesn't, uh, isn't thinking, okay? To, to say that the ritual that became that began to have its roots in the 2nd century BCE and maybe gained deeper roots in the 1st century BCE, somehow is retrofitted back to the time of Moses and so forth, is ridiculous. And finally, uh, we see already that 
in other places like in Qumran, they're not accepting this. Qumran's not accepting converts. And Rob, you've shown, I think, fairly uh, fairly well that in Acts 15, we have a number of different Jewish sects that are vying for what should we do, uh, vying for their position in terms of what should we do with the Gentiles. So even in the first century uh, of the Common Era, you don't have uh, you don't have a widely accepted like a everyone monolithic. Everyone agrees, monolithic. Everyone agrees. This is how you become a convert. It just didn't happen that way, and all of the evidence points contrary to anyone who would read. Gare in in the Torah and read it as um, as convert. Final statement. The same term gare, and in fact, if I remember correctly, the same word proslutos in the Septuagint is in the text where it says to uh, Israel, "You shall be gentle and careful and loving to the stranger in your midst, because you were strangers in Egypt." It's the same word gare. In the stone humash, they say, be, be uh, careful to the uh, converts, to the proselytes that are in your midst. And then they translate it, because you were strangers in mm. Egypt. Why don't they say you were proselytes in Egypt? It's the same word, the same text and everything, showing us that there's absolutely no way that you can, you can anachronistically in any way put convert back into the Torah. I like your analogy of the First Baptist Church, and I want to move on quickly because we're uh, coming to the end of our time. But uh, uh, part of what I was doing uh, during my time off was trying to figure out a thesis topic for my studies at Torah Resource Institute. And uh, this has been a, a difficult task. I had narrowed it down to several things. One of there were several different things that led me to uh, the choosing the topic that I did, which I will tell you uh, here shortly. However, uh, the nail in the coffin was a video that was put out by uh, someone who uh, most people, any, if you have a Facebook account and you are in the Messianic circles at all, <clears throat> you know exactly who Izzy Abraham is. Izzy Abraham ha was the founder and the lead teacher at uh, Holy Language Institute. Uh, he seems like a real nice guy, seems like a sweetheart. Um, but I was, uh, I was just baffled at, uh, at uh, the video series that he put out. He put out three videos. And uh, I'm going to uh, give you the 45-second uh, intro that, uh, from Izzy Abraham himself so that you can listen to what this video series was on. This is, this is the nail in the coffin that uh, helped me choose my, my thesis. Uh, and it, now I have one, two, three, four, five clips uh, from, uh, from the, this series. And uh, I think that you guys are really just going to get a, a lot of I have no idea. This is all new to me. I yes. And to me. Okay, here you go. Here's, here's his intro. Here's a picture from one of the oldest manuscripts of the Mishnah that we have. Jesus kept it. The Romans outlawed it. The entire Talmud is commentary on it. And Judaism today is based on it. The Mishnah and the New Testament come from the same Jewish world. And they have way more in common than you would think. Welcome to my new series, Mishnah Snapshots, <laughs> looking specifically at how the Mishnah sheds light on the New Testament. These startlingly personal glimpses of Yeshua of Nazareth through the lens of ancient Jewish law won't just give you a new perspective on the Bible. They'll make your relationship with Yeshua and with his Jewish people better than ever. Okay, so Izzy Avraham has... Now, it sounds like FFOZ. Yeah, well, so here's the deal is that... It, it, uh, <laughs> I, I'll, I'll give it to Izzy that, that there are good scholars, uh, E.P. Sanders debates this, Dunn debates this, uh, N.T. Wright debates this. Uh, there are good scholars within the, within the religious world, uh, whether or not we think they're right or not, uh, who, and of course, Neusner, uh, Jacob Neusner, a, a wonderful, great scholar who seems to have flip-flopped his view throughout time on uh, the place and history of the Mishnah. And uh, even N.T. Wright in his commentary on Romans will tell you that, uh, that in Romans 11.26, a passage that I was considering writing my thesis on, uh, that, uh, that Paul is uh, possibly referencing the Mishnah. So I will give it to Izzy Avraham here that uh, there are good scholars who uh, purport that there were pieces, at least, of the Mishnah around in, uh, in this time. However, I think that uh, Izzy Avraham has not only gone one step further, I think he's gone several steps further, uh, because he, has, he never even addresses uh, the historicity 
of the Mishnah. He just completely and utterly assumes that the Mishnah was not only around in the first century, which, by the way, we have absolutely no evidence of, but he uh, thinks that Yeshua not only followed it, but kept it. Uh, and let's listen to another clip by uh, yeah, and which man What manuscript of the Mishnah is he saying is authoritative? That's that's another problem. Well, he probably. never addresses that either. In fact, he doesn't uh, he doesn't want to. It doesn't seem that he wants to address the fact that there are various manuscripts of the Mishnah and that they differ quite uh, quite extensively. Um, so at least I, I didn't hear I didn't hear I didn't watch the entire series. Uh, maybe he does address it. I want to give uh, I want to give credence where credence should be do uh to uh the research that research that he's done however uh i think that he's made some major major missteps let's listen to another clip snapshots series in this lesson we are going to be talking about the million dollar question of what did yeshua think of the mishnah the answer to this question is that yeshua kept the torah as interpreted by the mishnah and taught his disciples to do the same. The exception was the rare case in which a tradition eclipsed a commandment, which was something he took strong issue with. But don't take my word for it. Let's look at what the Bible says about this important question. So now uh, uh, Izzy Abraham is going to switch gears. He's going to switch to the Apostolic Scriptures to show us what he means by this. I think that our listeners, if you are one of the 36 listeners to this show, then I uh, would assume that you already know the, the horrendous missteps that Mr. Abraham has taken here. First of all, he assumes, and I will let uh, the other gentlemen uh, on the show uh, comment uh, where they uh, in just a few seconds here, he assumes that the Mishnah, as we have it today, was around in the first century. Um, and not only that, but he assumes that uh, Yeshua is responding to the Mishnah and not the other way around. Any uh, comments from you, gentlemen? Well, I just want to make sure I, what I heard him say on this last, this last clip, if I heard the claim. The claim is Yeshua taught his disciples to obey the Mishnah, yes. except in specific areas where the Mishnah oversteps the Torah. Correct. That's, that's my what, paraphrase. Is that, that's what Tim, I is got that how you heard the claim? Okay. So, so, uh, and that fits with the first clip, which seems to say, look, you guys, we have the New Testament writings. What we do is what we have is this, uh, this code of ancient Jewish law that we need to put behind the New Testament um, so we look at the Mishnah as the background to the New Testament, and it's going to help. It's going to draw us closer to Yeshua. That's what I'm hearing. That's that's what I'm hearing too, and that's I think that's what he's saying. Let's see why he believes that. And uh, this is one that people bring up all the time. And this is this will be a focus. One of that's the, hogwash. <laughs> <laughs> this will be this passage that he's going to bring up is going to be one of the uh, one of the passages that I will uh, look at in my thesis. One indicator of what Yeshua thought of the Mishnah is how Luke mentions a Sabbath day's journey. The Hebrew term there is Tchum, Tchum Shabbat. This term isn't actually used in the written Torah, but it is discussed and defined. It's not used in, in Luke either. Yeah. <laughs> go ahead. It's, go. Not used, it's not used in Acts chapter 1 either, just the way of a Shabbat. The yeah. way, Hadas but, of a Shabbat. It's not, not only that, we have different, we have the Qumran, had different laws, well, even even amongst them, even even in the uh, in the Gemara on the Mishnah, you know, some say it's a thousand cubits, others say it's two thousand cubits, and some say it's ten thousand cubits. Right. Then and then and then is it a circle or is it a square? Yeah, this is precisely. Here, here's the thing, and and the fact that we have uh, a similar laws in, in the Qumran, it's not rabbinic. This is has nothing to do with rabbinic Mishnah, and this just shows that this person is not qualified to be making these videos. They. Yeah. It reminds me of this other book. Are we going to talk about this other book? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I forgot about <laughs> um, that. Hang on. But, we'll bring that up in a second. Yeah. Don't, don't let – this is – yeah. It, Let's so. listen to the end of his statement here. Here's the passage. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. So notice three things here. Firstly, that Luke mentions this Mishnaic interpretation of Torah in a positive way. Secondly, that Luke assumes that his readers and fellow disciples are on the same page with him on this. 
And thirdly, notice that Luke was one of Paul's closest traveling companions and ministry partners. This also suggests that Paul had a similar attitude towards the mission. So, uh, yeah, uh, there, are, there are so many problems with uh, this entire series that he's, that he's made. Uh, I think this next clip, it's 18 seconds. That, just to clarify, the way of the Sabbath, it, all it implies is that, some, that it's a traveling a distance where you're not packing up a load like you're, yeah. you're, you're going to come back the same day. It's, right. a, it's, a, it's a journey that you would go on and come back, and there's nothing that someone would look at you and say, oh, they're, they're headed out of town. Right. It's they, the idea you're not carrying a bunch of stuff with you. It's a leisurely walk. That's what a Sabbath day's journey is. It's a, it's a leisurely walk that has no uh, – that it's clear to all that there's no intention of traveling, of business, or anything like that. It's um, – well, and it's obvious that he's reading the Mishnah in English some, from some English translation. Yeah. He's not reading it, it, you know. And if he, uh, I, wait, now let's give let's give credit where credit's due. Uh, is he Abraham? I'm, I'm presuming he's. No, he, well, he said he said uh, to home. He, he used a, a yeah, he, he, he's, a term, which of course is not used by Luke. Uh, right. um, it's just hodos in Luke. Just the, the Greek word for way. But he, the 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 point simply is this: Mishnaic Hebrew is a lot different than Qumran Hebrew yeah, and a lot different than Tanakh Hebrew. Mishnah Mish, Hebrew is a development of Hebrew that it, it, it wasn't, it's not even established in the first century from any documents that most can find. It draws on Aramaic, it draws it, on Hebrew yeah. or Greek even. It, it, Latin. it, transliz, it transliterates Latin terms. Um, well, and, I, I'm not going. I'm not going to put down uh, Izzy Avraham's uh, knowledge I'm, of Hebrew. I'm saying that I'm just saying that he's coming from a position where he's not actually dealing with Mishnah as we now have it. Yeah, he's he's mixing his categories, right. which I I consider that building on sand. Yes, I do too. Um, well, let's listen to. I think this uh, next clip, 18 seconds long. Uh, this uh, this might be the one, or it's the next one. But uh, take, take a listen to this. Another indicator of Yeshua's thoughts on the Mishnah and the thoughts of his disciples on the Mishnah would be how the Day of Atonement is referred to as the fast. This is another term that isn't used in the written Torah and is a product of Mishnahic interpretation. Uh, that wasn't the clip I thought it was. But uh, once again, I think that he's uh, he's reaching on this because we do have uh, talks of the fasts or uh, fast days uh, within within the Tanakh itself. Um, the next clip, this is where I, uh, this was one of my favorite clips that I pulled uh, because he actually talks about uh, reading things back into, not that we're not allowed to read things from other times back into uh, uh, older times. Here's an example of this. When he had reclined at the table with them, and notably this is post-resurrection. This is after Yeshua came back from the dead. He took the bread and blessed. And uh, some translations will insert it in italics here. For instance, the New American Standard translation. He took the bread and blessed it. Um, this is a, an anachronistic reading. This is an example of translators inserting their own um, interpretations from another uh, era and another culture into the Bible. So, you know, in the Christian culture, people talk about blessing the food. But in the Jewish culture, we don't bless the food. We bless God who gave us the food. And uh, so anyways, and that was also what Yeshua did. He would say, Baruch Atad, and I blessed you. Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth, for instance, was the uh, traditional Jewish blessing that he, he would have said. So he said, he talks about not making anachronistic statements. Then he takes a prayer that was created much later, at least we don't have any evidence that it was uh, in, in the time of the first century, but didn't come around until much. I mean, I think the first, uh, the first uh, even uh, uh, alluding to that prayer is not until the 12th or 13th century. Uh, yet he says that Yeshua, so in the same breath, and this is what was so egregious to me, in the same breath, he says, we can't be anachronistic. This is the Christians putting this back, and the interpreters putting it back into this culture. And then he takes something from from 1,300 years later. And no, he, it's not that, Caleb. We, we have the Hamotzi earlier than that. Where? Um, I'll, I'll find it. I don't know exactly, what, but well, we it's don't, not no. that late. Sure, it is because we don't have we don't have a uh, we don't have a Mishnaic, full Mishnaic text until the 12th century. 
my accordance just crashed, so I'll have to check it later. But the point is, is that we don't that uh, we have scraps from of the Mishnah from from the Cairo Geniza, but I don't believe that the Hamotzi is found in any of those scraps. Which means the earliest scrap that we would have of uh, the earliest full Mishnah that we have is the 11th century. Here, here's here, here's the bigger point. The bigger point is a what we're hearing is um, this teacher has the idea of the such thing of as an anachronism. And, and he's going to use it. It's a tool in his toolbox. He's like, okay, i got to be aware of anachronism. On the flip side, he seems to be taking the rabbinic claim, rabbinic testimony of their own tradition at face value. So it, it goes back to the first century and, and earlier. Why? Because the rabbis say it does. Right. Um, there's, back, to, he's not, back to Sinai. Yeah, he's not using... Um, He's not using any other foundation um, because because if we just look from a historical perspective, it, um, he's approaching this all wrong. So he's not using historical perspective. He's using an ideological perspective that privileges the rabbi's word as authoritative, and it's that's the the avenue that he smuggles in uh, to put it behind the text of the apostolic writings to say it's it it's going to enlighten our eyes um there's no other path to get the mishnah back there except by just saying well the sages say it goes back then therefore it must be true so he's asking his audience to expand the canon of their faith basically um to take his to take the rabbi's word for it um and i think uh, that's where some flags go up for me and this could could, could i put out a, a quick challenge I would love for anyone listening to this program or who could pass it on to a scholar uh, uh, or maybe they are themselves a scholar, I would like them to tell me where we find the first clear uh, primary evidence of a written Mishnah. Written Mishnah. And now, my, and now, and now, I'm not just saying a scrap. I'm not just saying one thing or another. I'm saying a compilation of rabbinic halakha and discussions on the halakha, which we now know as the Mishnah, where do we find the first time that it is written in some form of completion? And this, and now my father is, uh, is somewhat uh, touching on my thesis topic. I've decided to, decided to write on, and my, I guess I'll give the working title of my, of my thesis, which is, Who Came First, the Christian or the Sage? Um, and basically what I will be doing is taking some of these passages that people like Izzy Abraham and others claim, and even N.T. Wright and, uh, and Sanders and, and uh, very good scholars, I'll be taking uh, passages where they claim that there might be some alluding to a, uh, the, the Mishnah or uh, the rabbinic tradition, and I will be trying to investigate what, when the first uh, Mishnah, compilation of the Mishnah happens and trying to date the Mishnah to see if the Mishnah is actually quoting Yeshua and his disciples or if it's the other way around. Right. And in that whole context, I would love to know, uh, I can look later, but I'll just bring it up so we all can talk about it at some point. Did N.T. Wright mention that when he's talking about Romans 11.26, that he thinks that it's, uh, uh, it's some kind of a quote or some kind of allusion to uh, uh, Mishnah Sanhedrin 10.1? Did, uh, did he bring up the fact that it's not the phrase, all Israel has a place in the world to come, is not found in the Kaufman manuscript. It's only found in the Eshkol manuscript. Yeah, yeah. And these are all things that I will obviously have to deal with uh, in, in, my, in my thesis, uh, which will be forthcoming probably in about two years. So keep your eyes open for that. Okay, last thing before we go. Well, Rob, you received a book in the mail, uh, and le let's uh, talk oh. about where you got this book, what the book is, and... and uh, I, this, was un this was an unsolicited um, what do you call it? Gift. Uh, it's gift. Yeah. Or so they didn't, they, in other words, the person who wrote this book, it, it's a book by a Patrick Kavanaugh. So I don't know if it was Mr. Kavanaugh who sent it or, um, it says, yeah, I'm not sure who it doesn't, it's not clear, but it was shipped to me uh, in care of Tor Resource, or Tor Resource in care of Rob, however you say that, Rob, yeah, as a review, limited review copy so they didn't contact me in advance. If it if they did, it went into spam. I never saw the email. Um, 
why it says it's called putting tradition on trial why the resurrection of the son of god did not occur on a sunday or saturday so i'll hold it i'll hold up the cover there for those interested uh, if you see watching us on video um boy this person's <laughs> written a 150 plus page book on the resurrection they obviously don't know it's clear they don't know the bible languages they're learn they're leaning on a translation that's i never heard of it's called the c let's see here yeah i should have had it the cvot and the clnt so the cvot is the concordant version of the old testament and the clnt is the concordant literal new testament that's an old the, it's an old version it's a, it's then there's the concordant version of the sacred scriptures. Yeah. Um, and that's out of Canyon Country, California. So uh, he's leaning on that. And there's a, a few things that I thought were interesting. One is that Yeshua is spelled Y Y A I S H U A. So it's Yay. wrong. If you if you spell Yeshua Y E S H U A, um, that is wrong. You have to, uh, they say it should be spelled this way. Um, there's a lot of interesting that, things that, here. That just, that just shows us that he, whoever the author is maybe doesn't understand that in our day at least, we don't know about ancient times, but the, but the tzere, when it was at the beginning of a word, was oftentimes pronounced very much like the segel, so short e, eh. We don't say cane when we say yes, we say ken. So to transliterate that, it would be an e, not an ai. Yeah, and and it get it's trying to uh, uh, unpack Matthew twenty eight one and and other passages. He compares, for example, the NASB with the King James version, which with the RSV, um, and tries to make an argument um, that you know the people have been deceived for two thousand years, and and so <sighs> you know I I don't know what what to do. It's it's an example of someone being excited and having resources to put their argument together, but they didn't, they weren't properly discipled. Right. Um, that, that's really what I'm seeing here. And, and by discipled, I don't even mean, I mean, in the broadest sense of the term, I don't even mean necessarily the spiritual, which is the most critical part of discipleship in terms of Yeshua. But I mean, it, it disciplined in terms of good scholarship. Yeah. The person is evident, uh, evidently, <clears throat> just by reading it, um, uh, is reflects that they, they lack any uh, training uh, and any uh, they've not been under a, a trained teacher to learn train to be trained themselves. I guess that's yeah. And so uh, my my one sentence is. Um, with all kind respect to the author we whom we don't know, I wouldn't waste my time or my money on this kind of thing. It will just end up being worthless. Okay. Well, um, while I was in uh, Disneyland, I saw a bunch of different mugs that I thought, you know what, I would love to have that and drink out of that on the show. And uh, then I realized they were like $19.99, and I thought, well, I <laughs> wouldn't like to drink out of them on the show that much. So I didn't buy them. But it did get me thinking, you know, if you have a special uh, mug that you would like to see on any of our programs, you can send that to <laughs> TorahResource.com, and uh, either Rob or myself would be happy to drink out of any mug that you might uh, send as long as it is not inappropriate, obviously. Uh, so send your mugs, people, and uh, we'd, we'd be happy to, to receive them. All right, guys, thanks so much, my uh, father, to my father, Tim Haig. President of Torah Resource Institute. Uh, classes for uh, the fall are already in session. His class on uh, First John begins tonight. And so if you would like to be a part of that, you can uh, learn how to sign up under our free classes section on TorahResource.com. And you can also find out how to sign up for our 
winter quarter of classes at Torah Resource Institute. Please do so. We'd love to see you in classes. We have a good student body right now, and uh, we are we are gaining steam, and uh, we hope that you'll come learn with us and that you will be able to uh, to handle the scriptures uh, in the original languages and, and uh, with some, some good education, and that you'll get discipled from, uh, good dis- uh, from good teachers like Rob Van Hoff himself and my father, Tim Hegg, also Gary Springer, who is our programmer, which I did not mention at the beginning of this show. Uh, so yes, also, if you have show topics, please send them to us. You can do that on our Facebook page. It's uh, backslash The Rob and Caleb Show. Or you can send them to me, chegg at torahresource.com. That's chegg at torahresource.com. I do read all my own emails, so you can send me uh, show ideas, or you can tell us what you hate about the show, or you can uh, tell me that I am a moron and an idiot, which many people decide to do each week through my email service. Until next time, we hope that this show has done one main thing, that is to glorify our great God and Savior, Yeshua, the Messiah. <laughs>